All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Revival Baptist Church. It is good to see everybody here this morning. If you would, please stand. We'll go ahead and get started at this time by opening in a word of prayer. Brother Dale, good to see you here this morning. If you would, please open us in prayer. Amen. All right, if you can grab your songbooks and turn to song number 246. Song number 246, we're going to sing Redeemed. Song number 246. <laughs> can turn over to song number 209. Song number 209, we're going to sing Sunshine in the Soul. Song number 209. There's sunshine in my soul today.
Welcome to Revival Baptist Church. Good to see everybody here on uh, this day, the Lord's Day. Good to see our church filled. We have several first-time visitors here with us. We're glad to have each of you. I did not get to shake everyone's hand, but we're glad to have you as part of our service this morning. I did get to meet the family from North Carolina and uh, here on vacation and in church. So I, that always tells me something good. They have a home church or you would not be in church on vacation. Uh, but assistant pastor at Woodland Baptist Church, and so good to have them here and their family uh, with us today. And uh, our other visitors, I know our ushers have a gift bag that they'll be handing out as a way of saying thank you for being with us for our services. We've had a great week uh, looking back on what God has done. I've not had the greatest week. I was out, out sick. Uh, I am better. Uh, praise the Lord. Thanks for the prayers. But as a church, as a ministry, we had a great week. Uh, we closed out the week with 31 salvations. That's tremendous. 31 salvations. And before, you know, you get on your high horse and, all oh, you must be preaching easy believism. Well, first of all, believing is easy. Amen. Now, I know what you mean. You know, one, two, three, repeat after me. It's not hard to be saved, though. Uh, but how many doors do we knock and knock and knock and knock? And how many soul owners went out this week? You know, and of course, you know, just looking back at what God has done, that doesn't count the 104 salvations we saw on the Puerto Rico missions trip the week prior. And so what a blessing it's been. I know Brother Scott will go over all those numbers, but it's been a great week. And then, of course, yesterday's fellowship at Peter and Brittany's house and them hosting us. It was a great day. So we're looking forward to what God has in store. Brother Scott, if you'll go over the announcements for us. We are definitely uh, appreciative and, and thankful for all that we see God doing. And uh, here today, we plan on having an entire day uh, of church today. So if you're a visitor and you'd like to stick around, we do encourage you to do so. We'll have fellowship after the service this morning and then lunch served as well. And the theme for lunch today is barbecue. So looking forward to that. And then we will go soul winning again this afternoon at 1.30. We'll get paired up, get into the vans, and we'll go out and knock door to door and preach the gospel of our Lord door to door. So that's at 1.30 today. We are, are certainly looking forward to that. And then our evening service back here at 4 p.m. later today. Two, two birthdays today. It is Sister Jennifer Metaliano's birthday today, so wishing her a happy birthday. And then also Pastor Boyle's birthday as well. So happy birthday, Pastor Boyle. Uh, a few birthdays and a couple anniversaries this week ahead of us. Uh, starting with tomorrow, uh, two birthdays. It's Spurrier Thrasher's birthday tomorrow. So how old Spurrier going to be? Two years old. Okay, so two years old for Spurrier on Monday. And then also Jonathan Kobzak's birthday. So happy birthday to Jonathan. And then on Wednesday, an anniversary for the Metalianos, uh, Brother Mark and his wife Jennifer celebrating an anniversary this upcoming Wednesday. And then our birthday on Saturday, it's Ezra Mendez's birthday. So how old's Ezra going to be? Three years old this uh, Saturday, so happy birthday to Ezra. And then next Sunday, another anniversary, a wedding anniversary for the Millers, Brother Dallas and his wife, Heather, celebrating a wedding anniversary this Sunday. Don't forget about our midweek service this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We will be in Revelation chapter number one. Uh, Lord willing, this week we'll start Revelation as we were supposed to this past Wednesday, but Pastor uh, not feeling well, as well as a few of the men that were on the Puerto Rico missions trip come back from that, and then, you know, not feeling well this week. So I know there's several of us out there that... Uh, could still use some prayer there as we're on the mend. Uh, but on Thursday night, we're looking forward to our midweek service in Jacksonville. Also at 7 p.m., we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter number 5 this Thursday night. And then for Saturday, don't forget that it's the first Saturday of the month, and we will have our soul-winning marathon in Sanford. So looking forward to that. Now, I've been driving through Sanford uh, for work over the last few weeks, and I've been dying to go soul winning in Sanford. I really believe that it's going to be a very receptive area, so I'm looking forward to the soul winning marathon in Sanford and seeing what the Lord will do this upcoming Saturday. So mark that down if you'd like to be a part of that. And then we also have our sign language class next uh, Sunday morning. For anybody interested in that, it'll be at 10 a.m. prior to the morning service this Sunday coming up. 
Uh, but moving on from the announcements to our praise report, as we continue to praise God for uh, looking back on the Puerto Rico missions trip, uh, we had 104 salvations out there. We went soul winning on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I think we went from uh, Canovanas to San Juan to Ponce to Ceiba uh, to back to San Juan. We were soul winning all over the island of Puerto Rico and praise God for uh, the doors that he opened up for us there. It was truly uh, amazing to be a part of that and just a church-wide effort, uh, just this covering that trip in prayer, and we're so thankful for that. And then also the McWilliams found out they're having a boy, so we praise God for that news there. That's exciting. And then uh, also, if uh, you had a chance to be here, the creation class, Brother Greg did a great job on Wednesday night uh, looking at the second heaven, uh, the solar system, and all that, uh, that good stuff there, and we were thankful for that. And then also, we had soul winning and uh, fellowship yesterday in Sebring, uh, we, and we're, we're thankful uh, for the boils for Brother Peter and his wife uh, opening up their house, their house to us, and, and I hope you know now that if you invite the church... No matter how far away you live, all right, the, the church is coming, all right? The whole church came. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and uh, we're thankful for that, and uh, hopefully you guys had fun too. <laughs> but we did go soul winning, and we had a great day out soul winning yesterday. Uh, I think we had 13 salvations at the group that met down in Sebring uh, as we, we hit a, a pretty big area. We had to find more area. We didn't know how many people were going to show up. And, you know, praise the Lord, you know, everybody showed up and we went soul winning. We had about 13 salvations out soul winning. And then we had a group going in Tampa. They had four salvations. And then Brother Brandon, he went soul winning in Coco uh, at the same time. So at the same time, we were soul winning in Sebring, Tampa, and Coco, both coasts of the state and right in the heart. <laughs> so praise the Lord for that. Uh, and so uh, I think we finished the day with 19 salvations just yesterday alone. So looking forward to continuing that this afternoon as we go soul winning at 1.30. But uh, paying attention to those that are still on the prayer list uh, for health, Sister Kim Dias still on the prayer list, so we want to continue to pray for her. And then also uh, the, the Miller family, uh, as they are, they're still thinking about their uh, Sister Heather's uh, brother passed away last week, so we want to keep them in our prayers uh, for that situation there. And then also Sister Danielle Obenauer, her mother is sick, uh, and she's uh, going to be having some, uh, some possible emergency, uh, emergency surgery uh, to remedy that situation, so we want to keep her in our prayers. Her name is Jamie, so we want to keep Jamie in our prayers there. She may be having surgery even yet today, so we want to keep that at the top of the prayer list. Our expectant mother, Sister Danielle, and Sister Amanda, both uh, with baby number two, one a girl, the open hours having a girl, and now we know that the McWilliams having a boy, so we praise the Lord for that. Want to keep them in our prayers. And then those that will be traveling, Sister Kim Bell will be traveling out west this week. So we want to keep her traveling uh, situation in our prayers, as well as Brother Raphael. Uh, he's going to be traveling to New York and then Puerto Rico. Uh, so uh, we want to pray for him and the traveling situation there that the Lord bless. Uh, but that's all I have for the announcements this morning. At this time, I'll ask our ushers to come forward. We'll take up the offering but before we do so, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Brother Caleb Frazier, if you would please pray for the offering this morning.
right, if you could please stand and grab your songbooks and turn to song number 121. Song number 121, we're going to sing Like a River Glorious. Song number 121. <laughs> church. I love to hear our church sing. I love to know that it's from our heart. And you know, you can't fake a song from your heart. And uh, what a blessing it is to be able to come together and hear our church sing. If you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, there in the New Testament. We're going to read the entire chapter, the first chapter there of 2 Corinthians. So I hope that you'll follow along in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, Brother Greg Cameron it's going to read our scripture for us this morning, then have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the preaching of God's word. Second Corinthians chapter number one, the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, was at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. 
For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that we will yet deliver us. Ye also, helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. For we write none other things unto you than that ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that ye have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. For the Frank, you can pray for us. Hey, man, I hope that you were paying attention as Scripture was read because the message will uh, kind of encompass the entire context of chapter number 1. And First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul is kind of writing to the church there. He's giving them an update. He's telling them of a battle that they've been through there in Asia. And he's kind of reporting back, thanking them for their prayers and their support. And, you know, we're, it's not a one-man show. The ministry is never all on one person. We're a body of believers. And, you know, everyone's important. Everyone has their role and has their spot. But what I like about this chapter is that Paul points out the fact that, you know, there were times we were discouraged. There were times we despaired even of life. Did you catch that? The Apostle Paul, you know, this giant in the faith, is sitting here writing to the church telling you, there's times I feel like quitting. There's times I don't want to just keep going on. There's times we physically could not keep going, but it was your prayers that kept us going. And that is kind of the thought as we begin to see. But look at verse number 8 as we see him uh, telling of the troubles he went through. He says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pursued or pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. I mean, they were just like, we were to the point where, you know, it's over. You ever been there? You read about prophets in the Old Testament that will, they, they wish they weren't even born. And you'll find thinking, how can someone who's a Christian, who has the hope of God within them, ever be in a spot where they're despairing even life? Let me tell you this, that'll happen to all of us. Now, it may not have happened to you yet, but it will happen. I hear a ringing. I don't know if you guys can help me back there. But it's going to happen to all of us. It's going to come at some point in time in your life. Maybe you're a newly saved Christian, and right now everything's great. Let me tell you something. It's great to be saved. Amen. I'm glad that for salvation. But you know, our flesh, that physical body, has not been saved yet. It hasn't been delivered. We're going to one day be given a glorified body. But our spirit, our soul has been saved. And so we have this war that is going on, and not always will your soul win the battle. Sometimes your flesh will take control, and you'll be thinking things you shouldn't think, and saying things you shouldn't say, and acting ways you shouldn't act. 
and you'll be sitting there thinking, why do I act this way? Why am I feeling this way? Well, it's encouraging to know that as you read of the great men of God in the Bible, they all struggled with the same thing. And they're telling you, I, there were times I despaired my life. Now imagine the picture we think of Paul. You know, I have in my mind this great missionary. I have in my mind this, he's going to be at the front of the line when it comes to giving out crowns for Christ. We'll pale in comparison to the, to the work that we've seen him do. And yet he's telling you, there were times I felt like quitting. There were times I gave up. But then he says, verse number 11, Yea, also are ye also helping together by prayer for us that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks, may be given on by many on our behalf. He's like, we were going to give up, but you know what it was that kept us going? The prayers of others. You helped us by your prayers. And so as I was sitting here writing the sermon, and it's been a rough week uh, physically for me. I know many other people have had some rough weeks. I know there's some people hurting in the church. I know there's uh, the, the, the Millers, they lost a loved one this past week, and just the different things that are going on, sickness, travel, uh, people lost jobs. There's, it's been a rough time. I mean, it's a rough time in America, uh, so to speak, uh, economically, financially, and so forth there. Let me just assume that there's people out there that are thinking about quitting. I mean, you go and you put your gas in the gas tank, and you're thinking, how long is that drive to church again? I mean, don't, there's, don't oh no, you'll never think about quitting. I'm telling you, your flesh will get you weary in well-doing, and you're going to sit there thinking about quitting at some point or another. And so we're not alone in that matter. And as we see this begin to take place, I like how he begins to conclude the chapter. We're kind of doing an outline. I'll get to my message in a moment. So the time has not started yet. This, the choir did not sing this morning, so this is choir time. Amen? How's it going? We, we'll have the choir back next week. I, I can read your faces. But anyway, we, ha we see, he says, at the end, he's like, it was not with us, yay and nay, and then yay and then nay. He's like, it was yay, yay. What's that? What is he saying? We weren't on and off. Yes, we felt like quitting, but we didn't quit. Yes, we got tired, but we kept going. Yes, we were discouraged, but we pressed on. He's like, we weren't off and on and off and on. People who are wobbling like that always end up falling by the wayside. When you can see them start to, start to struggle a little bit and they're making that wobble, they're hit and miss anymore, it's just, you know, pray for them, pray for them because it's a matter of time and they're going to be sitting on the wayside. Yep. And so there's nothing wrong with those, those feelings. If you get discouraged and you think, preacher, I woke up this morning, I just didn't jump out of bed and click my heels and throw my suit and tie on and go to church with this happy, uh, you know, go lucky spirit. I'm, just, I'm not there today, but you're here. Amen. That's a great place. And the Apostle Paul is telling you that's where he's been. There were times we felt like quitting, but our yay was yay. It was never yay and nay and yay and nay. But the key to all that is how the chapter starts, and that's where our text is. Look at verse number 3. Verse number 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God, notice this statement, of all comfort. Amen. And I know I've, I've, in my many years of ministry, I've preached on God's comfort. And we've looked at God as a comfort, the attributes of God as a comfort. But the phrase that stood out to me was the God of all comfort. You know, and I was thinking there's many different areas in the body of Christ. Maybe there's people here that, you know, you, you need comfort this morning, but none of us are aware of it, but God is. And God is the God, he's, he's so able to give all comfort to someone who maybe you backed out over your cat on the way to church or something. You know, to me, that doesn't need any kind of comfort. There's some kind of reward in heaven if you backed over the cat on the way to church, amen. But to some people, that's like, the, you know, we backed over our cat and it's dead. Well, God, God's a God of comfort. But then there's other people that have real problems, like the doctor said cancer. We know God has, a, God has a comfort designed for that situation. And then there's others that maybe you lost your job. Well, you know, God has comfort for that too. And then there's others where you're just not feeling so good today. Well, God has comfort for that too. God is a God of all comfort. So you lose a loved one. You don't know what to do. There's a hole in your heart. God can fit that comfort. He has the comfort needed for any situation, be it big or be it small. God is the God of all comfort. I find it interesting when God is described, you find all kinds of attributes about God, but one of them is that he's comfort. He's comfort. That's not an attribute. Now, I will say this, many of the modern day churches, that's all they focus on. And we get so tired of hearing it. You know, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And they never preach anything hard. 
They never preach any separation. They never preach any standards. They never pound the pulpit. They never say, thus saith the Lord. It's just, God loves you. God loves you. And so, may the pendulum not swing so far the other way where it's, rah, 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 don't quit. If you quit, you're a loser, rah, rah, rah. And then you're like, wait a minute, but God loves you. God wants to comfort you. You will be weary. You will get tired. You will fall by the wayside or think of falling by the wayside. You'll be sitting there sometimes in the shadows thinking, why do I feel like quitting? Hey, God is the God of comfort, and may we be reminded of that. All three parts of the Godhead are called comforters. In fact, the name of the Holy Spirit himself is the comforter. And so we can see that this is a a strong attribute of God because if you're actively serving God, mark it down, you will need comfort. Now, I'm not the kind of guy, I don't like to, you know, sit down and just pour out my emotions. I don't know. I'm, I, you know, so, preacher, tell me how you feel, how you really feel. I'm like, awkward. Yeah, yeah I, no. <laughs> I don't even tell my wife, you know, that's tell it to Jesus alone. I'm not just, I know everybody's different, but I'm just not the kind of guy that's like, you know, I'm having a rough day, and, you know, please pray for me. No, I'll just be like, hey, I'm doing great. But how many of you know we're not always doing great? And we're not all that kind that just need to pour out our heart to someone. And, and you know, sometimes you wonder about a guy that does. You're like, you know, <laughs> you still tied to that apron string or something? You know, something's wrong, amen. But you think about, think about some, just because we don't sit there and, and tell everybody all of our troubles doesn't mean we don't have them. But there's a place that we can go to get comfort when we do feel that way. And that's what the, the, the scripture is highlighting is that God is the God of all comfort. Yes, we despaired life. You prayed for us, and the God who comforted us brought us through, and that's why it was yay, yay, and not yay and nay. And that is the context for this morning. Now, if you will, turn to Romans chapter 15. That's the foundation. Let's look at the message. Romans chapter 15, look at verse number 4. Romans chapter 15, verse number 4. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, are written for our learning, that we through patient and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So why were we reading about Paul feeling like quitting? So that we too could find comfort in the scripture and have hope. That You know what? It's not only me. Sometimes it's easy to say, I bet Pastor Boyle never feels like, you know, quitting. I bet he never feels. You don't know Pastor Boyle. And Pastor Boyle's not going to pour out his heart to you either. Right? It's not how it's going to work. But Paul, under the inspiration of the scripture, is telling you, I felt like quitting. But God comforted me. God kept me going. And that's how I did it. And the Bible's telling us that there's comfort in these scriptures when we read about men like Elijah who felt like quitting. Why is he in the cave? What are you doing here? Why? What doest thou here, Elijah? And he begins to pour out his complaint to God. You know what God told him? Here, eat some bread. Take some time. Then he comes back later after he's recovered a little bit. He says, what doest thou here, Elijah? It's time to go now. You've been encouraged. You've been sta- sta- stabilized. I mean, I think of Paul when he says, we, when we could no longer for- forbear, we thought it best to be, at Athens, to be left at Athens alone. I mean, you can find so many examples of people in the Word of God. Jonah, Moses. I mean, think about all these men of God that did great things, and yet you'll find them at times in their life, and you're like, why are they like this? Why are they hiding? Why are they in despair? That is our nature. And the Bible says that through these pages, we can actually find hope in our time of need. The word comfort in its various forms is found 119 times in your Bible. But then that's not it, because that's just one word. How about the word pity? That would be the same thing. You know, you want someone to pity you. You want someone to just kind of have empathy. That's found in the Bible. The Bible says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Think about that. When you're having a hard time, God knows, and he pities you. Is there not comfort in knowing that God sees the struggle you're going through and saying, hey, I know it's tough, keep going? I mean, that's a whole lot different than, hey, draw it up, keep going, bud. When, okay, so let me give you an example of this. In the home, you have a mom and you have a dad. Who do you go to when you want comfort? Dad, right? No. Because <laughs> my kids, especially my boys, now, I was so scared of raising sissies that I, I, I had seen sissies. I mean, I'm talking five years old, they fall down, skin their knee, and they're screaming bloody murder. And they're wanting mommy to kiss it and put a Band-Aid on. You're like, you're five years old. You're 10 years old. You're 15 years old. <laughs> Joshua's just now where he didn't have to have the happy faces on the Band-Aids now. Just the regular Band-Aid work. 
And I remember looking, I'm like, that is not meriting a Band-Aid. You don't go to your mom. You do not net. You dry it up, young man. And I remember them, you know, skin flailing open like this. And you are fine. You dry it. Because I was just so scared of raising sissies that didn't know how to, you know, what's a blister? Oh, that's from work. <laughs> You're going to get a lot of those, you know? And so I remember to the point where my kid broke his bone. Kyle broke his femur. I mean, compound fracture. Broke it and his leg was all mangulated, and I scooped him up, and, I'm, and he's not crying. I'm like, son, it's okay. You can cry. And you know what? The only thing he did say, and I'll never forget those words, that I was sitting him in the back of the car, rushing him to the hospital. He said, Dad, please pray for me. And I thought, mm, where's my boy running when he needs help? Oh, Lord. And he was hurting. I walked in the emergency room, and I said, I have a compound fracture, the femur. femur I'm not setting him down. I need triage. And she's like, you have to fill out paperwork. I'm like, because he's not screaming. They think I'm joking. I'm like, this, this leg is broken. And they looked at that, and it was like they all jumped up, and they're all running around. Why isn't this kid screaming? I was so scared of having sissies. But let me tell you something. When the kids wanted empathy, you know who they would sneak off to? They'd find mom. You know what mom would do? Oh, come here. Oh, let me kiss the boo-boo. And let me go get the Neosporin. And let me go get, you know, and you're just like, okay, okay, it's enough. Three Band-Aids later, and that kid feels like a million dollars. You know, they didn't need the Band-Aid. They didn't need the Neosporin. You know what they needed? Pity. They needed comfort. They wanted just someone to understand, hey, I know what you're going through. And you know what? God is looking down from heaven saying, hey, I know it's tough. I know I've given you a job that's big. I know you're tired. I know you're weary. But hey, I know what you're going through. I'm the God of all comfort. God is looking down from heaven saying, I know what you're going through. I'm here to comfort you. Sometimes just that alone is enough to keep you going a little longer. How about this word, grace? Isn't that what grace is? That we find grace to help in time of need? That he has grace for grace? Whenever you need grace, he just gives you even more grace? How about this attribute of God? Tender mercies. I mean, these aren't that rah, rah, pound the pulpit, let's, you know, let's just call out the sins of the world. But this is, this is, there's a lot in Scripture that's covering these subjects. These are things that we need as Christians to be reminded of. How about compassion? This is another attribute, a, 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 a gift that God is giving to his people. Hey, this is the God in whom we serve. He is the God of all comfort. I think of all the trials and troubles. I think of those on our prayer list that we've been praying for for so long. I think of Sister Kim back there. Just the constant battle, trying to figure out what's going on with the health and the battles. You know what? There's grace for that. There's comfort for that. God can comfort that. They need a different kind of comfort than maybe you and I need, but they need comfort. How about Sister Jennifer with her eye and we've been praying for so long. You know what? There's comfort that God has for that situation. God can take care of that. I think of the open hours with uh, Sister Jamie, uh, Sister Danielle's mom and uh, the, the situation there facing some surgery. You know what? There's comfort for that. I'm glad whatever the need is, whether it's big, whether it's small, there's comfort and God is the God of all comfort. That's, that's what God is telling us this morning. So with that in mind, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And I'm going to give you three things to take away. That God is the God of all comfort. And if it's big comfort, small comfort, I'm glad you don't have to meet a certain criteria before God says, oh yeah, now you qualify for the Band-Aid. No, he's the God of all comfort. You're just having a bad day. You're just like, God, could you help me? There's help for you. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad for that, that we don't have to meet the bar. Hmm, the church has to have a vote on this one. I don't know. This doesn't, you're, sounds like you're being a big baby, buddy. I'm sorry. There's no comfort. There's no, you can't petition the throne of grace today because that doesn't merit the attention of God. You can call and talk to God about anything. Amen. And there's comfort waiting for you when you do. That's, to me, that's a blessing. Because, you know, here I was out sick with this cold last week. And, you know, I, I thought I was dying with, of a cold. You know, they say the closest a man can feel to understand the labor pains of pregnancy for a woman is when they get a head cold. And that's probably true because we are big babies about getting a head cold. So I feel like I had, you know, several children this past week. I, I had a head cold. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I literally was, you know, petitioning the throne of grace. And you know what? There was grace for a, a cold. But you know what? I was sitting there thinking while I'm laying there in bed with this cold, and I'm thinking, oh, God, help me. You know, there's probably people who've been given terminal diagnosis this week, saying, Lord, would you please help me? And here I am begging the throne of grace for mercy for a head cold. 
I remember that same time I took Kyle to the hospital. There I was, and you know, we're sitting, he's, his leg is broken. They had surgery. He put rods in his leg, and we're up in the recovery uh, of the, the fifth floor of the hospital, and uh, he was coming out of recovery. They were wheeling his bed in, and, and you know, here you are just sitting like, why did this happen, and all these different things, and, and it was kind of our first time realizing he had brittle bones, which I have brittle bones, and none of my other kids had it, and I thought maybe it skipped a generation, and well, found out he has brittle bones, and now I'm thinking, oh, his future is going to be like mine, and it's going to just, I, all these thoughts. And I look out across the hallway, and there's this kid, leukemia, hair all shaven, doctors going in telling the parents not so very good news. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know how easy it is to complain when all you can see is your problem? And you, and, and you know, sometimes I wonder how nurses can even do it. When you're sitting in there with your broken fingernail, and God, you, they're over there, you're just over there, oh, I need medicine, I need this, and you're just hitting, hitting that nurse button over and over. And they got to walk in with the same smile that they go into the person who's actually terminally ill, who's actually suffering. And they have to assume, just pretend like you're, this is the end of the world for you. I'm so sorry, sir. You're, I'm so, uh, no wonder sometimes they get a little snappy. You have no idea what's going on in the next room over, and you're pulling them over there because your ice cream melted, and you want a fresh scoop. I mean... But believe it or not, that's about how, be, how, petty, how uh, petty people can be. And it, God, but the thing is, when it comes to God, God wants to hear both sides. God's the God of all comfort. God says, I want you to bring me that, that little thing that seems little to you. I want to help you with that. The big thing that's bothering you, I want to help you with that. Oh, Lord, I'm going to, no, bring it to me. God says, I want you. So there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 7. And our hope of you, here's the thought is steadfast, knowing as ye are partakers of the sufferings, ye shall, uh, so shall ye be also of the consolation. And so because of this, the comfort of God and that he's the God of all comfort, number one, we can be steadfast in his comfort, knowing whether we've experienced that comfort or whether we know we're going to experience that comfort. I know that God knows what I'm going through. He knows the trial I'm facing. He knows how I feel. And I know he said there's comfort waiting. I can be steadfast that if I'm partaking of the sufferings, I know consolations around the corner. That's what he says. You can be steadfast knowing that consolation is coming. Well, I just don't feel good yet. You will keep hanging on. I still feel like quitting. Keep going. God will pull through. You watch. He's telling you, be steadfast. Don't quit in a time of suffering. Are we not promised tribulation, church? Do I need to park here for a little bit this morning? Because that was a very weak yes. In the world, ye might have tribulation, Jesus said. Is that what he said? In the world, ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He starts off that statement by saying, these things have I spoken to you, unto you that you might have peace. All right, he's going to give us peace. You're going to have tribulation. Oxymoron? No. You have peace through tribulation knowing he's already overcome the world, knowing there's a consolation coming. So as we fight the battle, as we go in our day-to-day -day life, as we go out and we go re preach the gospel to all the world and we get those doors slammed and we, get those, uh, the, we lose our job, there's a lot of things coming, uh, church, that haven't happened yet. Right. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of things that works we enjoy as Americans that aren't going to be here for very much longer. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot of Christians falling by the wayside. And you know, what's going to keep us going? Knowing that the sky is going to open up one day. Knowing there's consolation coming, that all wrongs will be made right one day. Knowing that God knows what's going on. Hey, there's comfort. We can be steadfast in our comfort. Now, it reminds me of, of a time back when we were missionaries in Romania. I don't have very many dentist experiences because I don't go to the dentist unless I have to. And I was in Europe, and of course, in Romania, the dentist are not like they are here. The dentist, you know, it's, a, it's, I wish I took pictures. I didn't, we didn't, cameras weren't really a big thing back then. And, uh, you know, if, if they were, it was like you put the, 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 the film in and you had 24 pictures. Anybody ever remember those old cameras? And it took you a whole year to try and finish the film. And then the last two of the 24 are just like nonsense pictures, just so you can develop the role. Now you have like these phones and you have thousands of photos of one event. You know, you're like, what in the world? How, how are cameras? But I, I didn't take any pictures. I wish I would have. But I mean, it's just like dirty, dark, outdated. And I had this tooth that was bothering me so bad. And I went in, and the dentist's like, well, 
This is in Romania. Now he's like, well, I don't have any pain medicine, medicine for you, but I need to drill that cavity out, and I'll, I'll cap it. He says, it takes about five minutes. If you can endure five minutes, you'll walk out without a toothache. Five minutes? For what I've been going through, I'll take five minutes of excruciating pain to get rid of this toothache. Count me in, doc. He sits me down. He's like, now what you're going to do is you're going to grip here, and you're going to put your legs here, and you're going to strap yourself down, and all you got to do is raise your hand, and I'll stop drilling and let you take a break. He says, but the longer you can let me drill, the faster this will go. I'm like, five minutes, I don't care how bad the pain is, I'll be out of a toothache. I'm thinking I can hold on for five minutes. And I remember I'm sitting in the chair, I'm braced in, here comes that drill, he touches my tooth, my hand goes up. <laughs> like, whoo! <laughs> it's like, son, this isn't going to work. And I remember the fight going on. I eventually got my tooth filled, but it was, there was some crying, there was some screaming. But you know what got me through it? It's only going to be five minutes. And finally, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, when you, you see all those old pictures of people coming out of dentists with their mouth like that, that was me. I, you just come out of World War III, you know, and you're just like, but the pain was gone. So God's telling us there's pain coming, but I've been there. I know what you're going through, and you're going to get out of it. Can you hang on? There's comfort. Can you hang on? It's not, not that he's going to take away the problem. He's not taking away the pain. There's going to be pain. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be some tribulation. But can you hang on? There's comfort that will get you through it. It'll be worth it all. That's what he's saying. Be steadfast knowing that there's comfort. Let me just go ahead before we go too much further. The world. So, so when you think of escaping the Christian life and retreating back to your old life, there's no comfort there to begin with. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I'm just going to get out of this and go back. You forget how bad it was, don't you? It wasn't that good to be. It's kind of like the Israelites, when they're facing whatever it is, their battle, the Red Sea, whatever it is they're facing, they remember the leeks and the garlic of Egypt. Now, did they eat well in Egypt? No. Did they live well in Egypt? No. But doesn't our mind kind of have a way of playing tricks on us? Man, I, I love the testimonies. I gave it all up for Jesus. Really? Are you telling me you're worse off now than before you got saved? You know, you just have a way of remembering things a whole lot bigger than they were before you got saved. Hey, how about this? You were a sinner on your way to hell and a destructive life. You were headed for, I mean, your life was on a train wreck, and all of a sudden God picks you up and sets your feet on a solid rock and establishes your goings. That's what happened when you got saved. Amen. And may we not forget that. We ought to have this thought of being steadfast unmovable. Turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse number 14. I love this passage because it reminds us that not only this God of all comfort, he's been where you've been. He's not asking you to do something he's not already done. Hebrews 4, 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed unto, into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, here's that thought, let us hold fast our possession, uh, uh, profession. He's like, be steadfast. Why? For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what he's saying? Now, this is kind of a tongue twister. We have not an high priest that cannot be touched. What he's saying is our high priest isn't this sitting on a throne somewhere who's never known your troubles, who's never gone through what you're going through, who has no idea of the pain and suffering and just telling you, just keep going, you, you got this, buddy. Some of the worst comforters are people who have never been through what you're going through trying to tell you you're making a big deal out of it just keep going they're like whoa buddy you don't know what i'm going through and our high priest the lord jesus christ is not one that sets, sits in heaven never lived on this earth never left heaven's glory never lived in a manger or born in a manger never grew up a pauper no place to lay his head spat upon ridiculed hung on a tree that's who he is it's not that he never did any of that and he's in heaven saying come on guys how hard can it be kind of like watching the shuffleboard game yesterday i was sitting there that doesn't that makes us all sound old <laughs> shuffleboard game we're watching the shuffleboard game yesterday. I'm like, come on, guys, how hard can it be? And then you get up there and you're like, oh, it's a little harder than it looks. See, our high priest knows how hard it can be. 
He's been there. He's walked this earth. He's been homeless. He's lost friends. He's been spat upon and ridiculed. He knows what you're going through. That's the high priest that you can go to, and you can say, Lord, I need help. And he says, you can come boldly, and you'll find it. There's grace this morning. There's comfort this morning, if you'll go to him. But not only should we be steadfast in that comfort, but we should, number two, share that comfort. If you're back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse number 4. There's a reason he gives us that comfort. We should share that comfort. There's times when you, so there's two places the Christian life should find themselves. Needing comfort, giving comfort. You either, one of those two, you're either needing comfort or you're giving comfort, but that sh- you should find yourself in one of those places this morning. Now, if you're always in need of comfort, there's a problem. Like, wait a minute, why is it always you, right? Why is the church, you know, you're 30 years old and you're still wanting the, the Spider-Man Band-Aid. Okay, we got a problem. Okay, so there's a time when we need comfort, but then if we're not in need of comfort, you know what we should be doing? Seeking those that do and comforting them. That should, if that's the attribute of God, may it be the attribute of Revival Baptist Church. Amen. May Revival Baptist Church be a place that you can come and get comforted, where you can come and be refreshed and encouraged and send you on your way. We got people traveling through all the time. What a blessing. You know, I pray they leave and get a little excitement, go back to their church and say, hey, let's go do something for God. I pray we can be just a little bit of a comfort. We either need to be comforted for ourselves or be comforting others. Do you see that there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 1? Look at verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of who? God. So as God comforts you, you're then to comfort other people. You know what I found? Something ironic. Those who've received the most comfort are the worst comfort caregivers. Those who've been forgiven the most can't forgive anybody of anything. Isn't that amazing how that works? Those who've received the most mercy of God find themselves the most merciless people. Those who the church has overlooked so many things are the ones pointing out the sins of everybody else still in the church. That's not why God forgives you. That's not why God comforts you. God comforts you so that you can then be a comfort to everyone else. You know, you would think the more comfort you need, the more merciful to others you'd be. Like, man, I know what you're going through. I'm so sorry. Pray. You know, sometimes just, I'm praying for you. It goes a long way. And sometimes just a card. Sometimes just a smile. Just the church reaching out to another member of the church saying, we know what you're going through. That goes a long way. The Bible says that we're comforted not so that we can feel good, not so that we can just kind of have a a great life, no, but that we can then be comforters to others who find themselves needing the comfort that we ourselves needed. Now, there's plenty of places that we can go to, but I want to kind of get to the end, and we're running out of time, but here's a great example of being a comforter. Ready? soul winning. Did you know the gospel message is a comfortable message? It's a very comforting message. When you're out there knocking doors, the Bible says many places in the, in the, in the uh, prophets, Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord. Speak comfortably unto them. Speak comfortable words. What are those comfortable words? The gospel. Right? Isn't that what Jesus came he came to, co- to comfort the people. He came to save people. He came as Savior, not as judge. Oh, he's coming back as judge. But he came as our comforter to give the good message to all people. That's even the, the proclamation at his birth, was it not? Great, uh, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. It's like, hey, fear not. He's coming with good news this time. And it's for everybody. Go spread the word. The comforting should be for everyone. You know, when you're out knocking doors, you're actually comforting people. And what a, what, a, what a blessing it is to come back and hear the stories of soul winning that took place. I'll give you an example from Puerto Rico. We were, one of the days it was, it was starting to rain and we didn't know what to do. And so it's a, Puerto Rico is a blessing. Like you literally can do things in Puerto Rico you can't do here. Like we went, we went soul winning places that we would never consider going soul winning here. We went soul winning in the mall. It was raining. We're like, let's just go to a big mall. We'll walk around and they'll kick us out. But we'll just go until we can't go soul anymore. We were going so many so long, and we were like, we were like very covert about it because we felt like we were doing something wrong. Like, speak English? 
You speak English? Hey, we're from Revival Baptist Church in Florida. We're, we're all trying to be like, mm -hmm. security guard. And the next thing you know, after about an hour of it, we're like, hey, we're from Revival Baptist Church. Hey, we're from Revival Baptist Church. Hey, we're Next thing you know, we're walking up to the security guards. Hey, we'd like to give an image. Oh, oh, awesome. This is, we're like, wow, this is allowed. This is great. And I remember there was, we were walking around, and we were still kind of in the timid. We didn't know if we were allowed to. We didn't, we didn't want to ask. And we were just like, there was this vendor sitting off to the side on the floor, and he had some booth in the middle of the aisle watching people walk by. I think he was making keys or something. His name was Anthony. And I walked over, and I saw him sitting there. I was like, hey. You, got to, you speak English? He says, I do. And he's just kind of sitting against the wall leaning. I said, well, we're from Revival Baptist Church, and we're actually out here to preach the gospel and show people how that they can go to heaven when they die. Do you have a few moments? He says, I know I'm not going to heaven. I said, oh, boy. I said, what's your name, sir? He said, Anthony. I said, Anthony, why would you tell me that? What, what makes you think that? And he began to share his story, sitting there on the floor on the, of the mall, and he had a very religious background. His family was religious. He had a pastor somehow, either uncle or grandfather or something, and sounded like work-based, which typically all religions are work-based. Yeah. And apparently he was not living up to those standards that the family had set, and so therefore he had concluded, I'm going to hell. I can't live those standards, and neither do they. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And I said, well, I said, Anthony, I got good news for you. I can show you from the Bible that going to heaven has nothing to do with how you live or what laws that you keep, but it's something God just gives you because he loves you, could I show you? And I remember his eyes, he looked up like he'd never heard that before in his life. And he's like, well, sure. And so I began to show him from the Bible, and I showed him that we're all sinners, and I went through the plan of salvation. I said, that means the religious people, they're sinners. He's like, yeah. I said, that means you're a sinner. He's like, oh, I know I'm a sinner. And then I showed him how we're all deserving. We all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. doesn't matter how much sin you have. We all have sin and we all come short. He's like, and he's agreeing with that. We get all the way to the end. Let me tell you something. There was a comforting message being given to a guy who had already concluded, no chance of me getting to heaven. And I get to show him from the word of God that those that receive the gift of God, that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and put their faith in what Jesus did on the cross, they're eternally saved. Amen. That was a comforting message. And I got to the end, and he bowed his head, and he prayed and asked Jesus Christ to give him that gift. Let me tell you something. He'll be in heaven. Amen. There's a vendor sitting on the side of the, on the, leaning up against the wall of a mall in Puerto Rico who needed some comfort. Here we are trying not to get thrown in jail in Puerto Rico, trying to slip some, figure out who we can slip stuff to, and God led us to this man named Anthony. Coincidence? I think not. People need some comfort. And you know what? You need to be a comforter. You need to go out there knocking doors. How many, we were talking to Brother Sean Pizak this afternoon, or this morning, and it was like, how many times when we're out soul winning do we hear this statement? And soul winners can echo. You know, I was just praying the other day, or this morning I prayed, or you know what, last night. It's funny you should knock on my, it happens over and over and over and over again. All you have to do is get your Bible and go be a comforter and go preach the gospel to someone. Hey, let's be steadfast. Why? Because there's a comfort. God knows what you're going through. Don't quit. No one said it was going to be easy. What else should we do? Share that comfort. We should share that comfort. But then lastly, go, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, number 1, verse 3. You all got a little excited when I said lastly. Now you're acting like you're not excited. I can, <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. Notice how it starts. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. You know what this chapter is? It's a chapter of praise to God. He's, Paul's writing to the church saying, let me tell you something, blessed be the God, the Father of all mercies, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all comfort. He's praising God for the comfort he's gotten. And when you go into those prayer chambers needing comfort, when you come out, you'll come out with a song in your heart. When you hear from God and God comforts you, whether it's through a knock on the door, whether it's through a phone call, whether it's through someone just a uh, handshake at church or what, a scripture that you read, and God answers that prayer and he comforts you, let me tell you something, you're going to get excited. How many times have you seen it as soul winners? You, 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 you say, in Jesus' name, amen, and you look up and they're crying. And it's not until after they pray that they share with you the backstory. 
And they're more excited than you are because they just saw God answer a prayer. I think of Levi, the first soul that Brother uh, Sean and I got to lead to the Lord. There's this boy, and we, we lead to the Lord. And at the end, he said this. He said, I had just given up on God. He said, what was it, two weeks prior to us going to him, he said, I gave God one more chance. He said, I prayed. And I said, God, I'm giving you one more chance. And he said, and you two walked up. I mean, you talk about a joy. This, it was so moving that Brother Sean's like, here, take my personal Bible, buddy. Read it and grow in the Lord. I mean, there were tears. There was excitement because God had just pulled through. Let me tell you something. Thirdly, we ought to sing about that comfort. We ought to be singing about that comfort. Christians ought to be the most happy people in the world. But how is it experiencing the comfort the world never has, we find ourselves miserable? We find ourselves pouting. We find ourselves in need of even more comfort. And hey, how about this? How about we just sing about this comfort? And I'm not talking about singing when it comes. I'm talking about singing knowing it's coming. I'm talking about enduring the hardship today with the song in your heart, knowing that I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how it's going to end, but I trust my Lord. I'm going to sing my way through this. And you know what you'll find yourself? Just like Paul and Silas. When Paul and Silas were in the jail, the Bible says that they were beaten they were thrust, they rent off their clothes, they were cast into prison, they thrust them into the inner prison, and they made fast their feet in stocks. Doesn't sound like the hotel. Then the Bible says, and at midnight, with all this going on, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Praising him for what? Praising him for what? They didn't know anything was about to happen. But you know what? They said, you know what? God is the God of all gods. He's the God of all comfort. I don't know what he's going to do, but I know God's in control. And here they are singing. And they're not singing some woe is me song. Help me, Lord. Help me. You know, it's like some country, bluegrass, those music you sing. You're like, you're sitting there. You get depressed listening to it. That's not... They were singing praises to God. And don't you be clipping that video back there. <laughs> There's a new meme out there. I can see it. Amen. I don't sing country well, apparently. <laughs> they were singing praises to God. I mean, think, open up that hymnal and find one about praise and just start singing in prison, locked up, clothes ripped off, beaten, scourged, no food, sitting there with the rats in the darkness of midnight, singing praises to God. How did he get that? the God of all comfort. Hey, I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know how much longer you're going to go through it. My message this morning is not, if you have a Pollyanna outlook on life, it's all going to go away. My message is, hey, I don't know when it's going to go away, if it's going to go away, how it's going to happen, but God's in control. He has the comfort you need. You can keep going, and why don't you just go ahead and put a song in your heart today about it? Amen. Just decide, I'm going to sing to God, not knowing how it's going to end, but I trust in the Lord, and I believe he can, and he will. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for our church, and God, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us as we all face our, our struggles and trials, and Lord, I know, Lord, as a whole, the church, Lord, we've been doing well. We've seen souls saved and baptisms, and Lord, decisions made, and new families joining, and Lord, it's, it's not that things aren't going well, but oftentimes it's in moments like this that people find themselves sitting in the shadows, hurting, and no one notices, and no one seems to care, and Lord, our old flesh begins to take over. God, I just pray, Lord, that we could each this morning with our, with our head bowed, look inside our hearts and just ask you for that comfort that we need. And then, Lord, leave here with that song of faith, knowing it's coming, knowing that you will be what we need. You'll be there for us. And then with that strength and with that renewed energy, look around to others and comfort them as you've asked us to do. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand, grab our hymnals. Page number 404. This is a good one to sing when you're in prison. Page 404. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Amen. All right, song number 404. We're going to sing When the Battle's Over.
that hope with us this week. We're going to have a crown. It's going to be worth it all. You're not going to get to heaven and think, man, I did way too much for the Lord. But I don't care how much you've done. We're all going to wish we did more. And so keep going, church. Be, don't be weary in well-doing. Thank you to our guest here uh, representing Woodland Baptist Church. Glad to have you here with us today. We'll close out in a word of prayer. Everyone's invited to stay for lunch. Barbecue is the theme, so you know there will be plenty of good food back there. Brother Jacob Pitchford, could you close us, please?